okay, like, let's say coming here, you thought, I'm going to come here because James sometimes sounds like he knows what he's talking about and there's a chance I might learn something that I can use in my life here. Your inner dialogue is determined by your thoughts. Your thoughts are, hmm, I kind of want to lose some weight. I want to shape up, I want to be fitter, I want to learn a little bit more. Then your thoughts are determined by your feelings. I feel kind of unhappy with my body or I feel like I could be a little bit better. Your feelings are determined by your total environment, so everything that's going on around you, the things you see, the things you hear, the things you think, the things you say, the things you do. That environment is constantly being scanned by your brain. Your brain is constantly on the lookout for threats to its impending survival. Like, the easiest way to explain it would be if I stood behind somebody and I swung a hand out, their brain would be like, oh shit, what's this hand doing here? You know, you're in a safe environment now, you know the prediction and the response is like, it's probably not going to hit me, I'm going to just stay here cool as a cucumber. Um, but if that was out in the street and somebody's hand came flying past your face, you'd duck. Okay, so your brain is scanning the environment to see what's going on and what it needs to do in response. The meaning given to that environment then is determined by the active part of your brain. And I was trying to think of, trying to think of an example earlier to explain this, but you know, I was struggling and like someone actually made it a lot easier for me again there. Like let's say for example in this, my environment right now is a room full of people looking at me as I'm talking and as I'm explaining something. So like probably at humans most vulnerable point where you're in front of a group of people who are ready to judge you. In that environment we had like people coming in late, we had people moving around, we had a lot of stuff going on. Maybe had somebody checking their phone or looking at their watch. So right now, I'm confident, I'm centered, I'm happy, I know what I'm talking about and that I can deliver this stuff. So I see somebody looking at their watch and I think, hmm, I bet they wonder what time it is. Or I see somebody looking at their phone and I go, hmm, I wonder if their phone just vibrated in their pocket. Somebody comes in late and I go, hmm, traffic must have been bad or maybe they just suck at timekeeping. Okay, not a big deal. <laughs> well, you, you did lose 10 minutes having to go back and get your phone earlier, Phil. Um, <laughs> So I'm in, like, I'm in like my human brain, I'm not in my animal brain, I'm not worried, I'm not under threat. If I was standing up here and this was like a college presentation where I didn't really know what I was talking about or where I was, whether, when I was nervous and worried about stuff and that stuff happened, I'd look at somebody, look at their watch and go, fuck, I'm boring them, I better speed up. Or they're looking at their phone, I'm like, shit, they can't even pay attention to me for like 60 minutes and that crap of presenting. Or I see them moving around and leaving, I'm like, fuck me, it's like the ultimate failure. Fucking she's gonna go home and cry. So within the exact same situation I can have a number of different responses depending on which part of my brain I'm in. So if you translate that across to goal setting and to achieving stuff, depending on what part of your brain you're in, depending on where you're at at a moment in time, your response to a situation could be totally different. So in other words you never really get to meet the same person twice, you never get to have the same conversation twice. So when you come back and look at all this then, the problem isn't motivation, the problem isn't confidence, the problem isn't all of the things we've spoken about, the problem is again threat. Because if I'm in the wrong state of mind and if I'm in the wrong place, I'll perceive everything as trouble. And if you're reactive to everything and if you're always lashing out at people, you probably have a th higher threat index. And like I don't want to make this like potentially socioeconomic thing, but if you think about like Let's say people from like socially disadvantaged areas. This is such an awkward topic to talk about. Um, they tend to be more aggressive. Like anyone, anyone who's taught in a school or been in a school with people who would be classically ranked, like on a CSO ranking in a lower socioeconomic profile. Um, they tend to be more reactive, they tend to be more aggressive. And I'm not saying that's absolutely the case always, but just in general that kind of plays out. And a lot of the time it's because they come from a threat-based environment. Depending on how your mother perceives life when you're born or before you're born, that can have massive effects on how you perceive the world when you are born. <coughs> and again, I'm completely polarizing this, I'm not saying it's always the case, but just in general, people act the way they act because of what's going on in their head. They're not choosing to be dickheads. They're not choosing to be aggressive. It just happens. So cut them some slack. Okay, so you don't have a mindset problem anymore. You have a brain set problem. You're in the wrong brain. 
It's not that you're logically making mistakes, it's just you can't formulate clever thoughts and intelligent thoughts because you're not in that part of your brain. And then each brain has its own threat and indicator. So am I losing social connection? Am I about to get smashed by this truck? What's the problem here? So you don't get to meet the human until the animals are happy. Only like the logical human part of your brain has a mind. So any mindset work you do, trying to train that is completely wasted if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So if you're worried about something, if you're under threat, if you are more concerned with eating the next day or like affording to eat the next day, then you are with going training. You're not going to go training because you have bigger stressors going on. So mindset work is completely wasted until you're in the right frame of mind. So you need to be in a safe, controlled environment for that to happen. And with all this, the thing is never the thing. Okay, the thing is not the thing. Nobody wants to lose weight. Nobody wants a bigger car. Nobody wants nicer clothes. Nobody wants a fancy watch. Nobody wants to go on a lovely holiday. Okay. What they want is the thing that comes after the thing, the so that moment. So I want to lose weight so that I'm more confident. I want a fancy car so that people will look at me and think I'm successful. You want a feeling off of the things you do. That's really what you're looking for. You're not looking for weight loss or fat loss. You're looking for the feeling that it brings. So again, just being conscious of this stuff and just understanding that that's a part of it will help clarify so much bullshit stories within your head when it comes to beating yourself up because you're failing or why you can't stick to a diet or you know all that bullshit. Anyone, anyone who's done something that, that isn't them or they look back at it and go, Jesus, that really wasn't me, you're doing it because you wanted the thing that wasn't the thing. So I know right now you're probably at this point. It's like, what the fuck has James been talking about <laughs> for the last 45 minutes? <laughs> it's just too kind to laugh at me. Um, so let's, let's think about it, about it in a linear fashion instead, okay? Your sensory system, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your, your taste, your skin, are constantly scanning the environment trying to see what's going on. Off of that, you start to feel certain things. Off of those feelings, thoughts start to manifest. The thoughts turn into actions, and the actions either support or don't support the things you want to achieve. But it's senseless, and there's no point trying just to change your thoughts if everything above it is still causing you trouble. Oh my god, I'm so shit. <laughs> <laughs> Overshare. <laughs> so what's the point in trying to change your thoughts and your actions if all the key primary drivers above it are still fucked up? It's like looking at like that training pyramid I always talk about. You won't get stronger if all of the base level stuff like your nutrition and your rest and your recovery are off. Same principle here. So let's just talk about some actual practical things that I found super helpful in, in dealing with this sort of stuff. It's just, it's simple things like, you know, starting your morning right. And Sarah was talking about this a while ago when it came to pumping yourself up first thing in the morning so you attack the day with energy. So what do you need to see here, taste or do, to eliminate fears and start the day right? What do you need to do to wake up, to feel awesome, and to walk out of your house and be like, sweet, let's go? That links in really closely to what's the worst that could happen because don't imagine it'll never happen. Plan for it and prepare for it. Most people start the morning wrong because they get up late, they hit the snooze button 20 million times and all of a sudden the first thing they have on their day is fuck, fear, stress, worry, I'm gonna be late, I don't have time to eat, I've gotta get this done, I've gotta get that done, fuck, I forgot my phone. <laughs> so what's the worst that could happen? You're gonna wake up late, you're gonna wake up with five minutes to go before you've got to be out the door. If that happens more than once, your problem isn't that you're getting up late, your problem is you're not planning to get up early. Okay, you know you get up late, you know you do all this bullshit stuff, leave your clothes ready, prepare some food the night before, plan for the absolute worst so that when it does happen you're not surprised, you've created an adequate prediction and response and you still maintain that safe position where you can go and tackle your day. It's why food prep is so important. You know, We've all been on the road, we've all been out and caught out without food. First thing you do in that situation is go to something comfortable and something easy. So if you plan for it, it makes it easier. This environmental scan, like this is, this sounds ridiculous and it sounds weird and you're gonna look at me and think I'm a freak. But if you do it, I guarantee in a week or two, you'll be happier for it. So an environment scan is really just going into your home, observing everything around you, okay? Go in and like consciously look at each piece of the puzzle. Like, 
I walked in here and let's say the, the mic box is on the table. I really wasn't comfortable with it there because I think it looks untidy and sloppy. And I have a camera on me so I'm super conscious that I want it to look good after I post a video. So I could have left it there and just kind of looked at it every couple of minutes and gone, shit, this is going really badly. Or I can just move and get rid of it. So if you have things at home that you look at and they bother you, like, I don't know, an ugly, an ugly present that your girlfriend's parents got you. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> but if you, if you have something like that that's around that bothers you, just remove it, just take it out of your environment. Just make your environment things that make you feel happy and things that make you feel good. Um, so rank them, are they positive, are they neutral, are they negative? Like a really concrete example of this for me is if I come home after coaching and like the overhead lights in the kitchen and living room are on, I freak out. Like I literally walk in and it's just stress immediately because for that, for me that's like, that's activity, that's awake, that's doing stuff. That's not winding down to sleep and relaxing. So the first thing I do every day is just walk in and turn off the lights. Like I don't even think about it anymore and Sarah will tell you about this. I lose the head if it goes, like not actually shouting at her lose the head, but <laughs> I, like, I walk home and I'm like, oh God, oh God, I can't handle this. I've got to turn the lights off. That's just something simple like that. If I left them on, I'd be going to bed in bits. Hmm? Don't leave them on. No, exactly. <laughs> and that's my point. Remove, remove things to piss you off from your life. <coughs> even if it's people. Yeah, I know. Um, but again, I'm not in the logical human part of my brain there, I'm in like the animal part of my brain. So I can't really, I can't really logically explain why it annoys me. So is stuff positive, neutral or negative? If it's negative, just get rid of it. Try to put more message rich stuff in your life. More reminders, more mementos, things that make you feel good about stuff. The easiest way to think about this right now is like, your RAS, your reticular activating system is basically a way of seeing what you look for. Okay, so, just like listen to what I'm going to say now. So, okay, so blue, 